Good afternoon and welcome to Middle East in Focus. I'm Negwa Ibrahim. Amnesty International recently released a report entitled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians, Cruel System of Domination and Crimes Against Humanity. In the report, Amnesty International joins the assessment of other human rights groups saying that Israel is carrying out, quote, the crime of apartheid against Palestinians and must be held accountable for treating them as an inferior racial group. Building on a growing body of work, Amnesty International, in this 280-page report, documented and analyzed Israel's institutionalized and systemic discrimination against Palestinians within the framework of the definition of apartheid under international law and concluded that Israel has perpetrated against Palestinians the international wrong of apartheid as human rights violations and a violation of public international law. A day after the report was released, dozens of U.S. lawmakers from both the Democrat and Republican parties released statements rejecting Amnesty's findings, with some even accusing the group of fueling anti-Semitism. Now, meanwhile, a handful of progressive Democrats, though, including Congresswoman Betty McCollum, Cori Bush, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, appeared to back the report through social media um, posts. In response to the report, Congresswoman McCollum proposed a bill that would restrict Washington's $3.8 billion a year of military aid to Israel over human rights abuses, stating, quote, Congress can no longer ignore or excuse Israel's occupation and system of oppression. With us today to talk about Amnesty International's new research report, again entitled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians, is our guest Aya Ziada, Advocacy Director of American Muslims for Palestine. She's a Palestinian American human rights scholar, activist, advocate, and writer who maintains a track record in organizing awareness of Palestine and other crucial human rights issues. She has over five years of political and grassroots advocacy and lobbying campaign experience and is specialized in Palestinian rights, resistance, and the dynamics of ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Welcome to Middle East in Focus, Ms. Siada. Thank you so much for having me. So... You know, as I sort of laid out in the beginning, Amnesty International did release this report um, once again, in case anyone missed the intro, entitled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians. So there's no mincing of words. Very clear that Amnesty is establishing within this report that Israel is an apartheid state um, and is violating international law. Now, what, if any, do you feel is the significance of this report? The whole report is very significant because it comes in a time where there's this big narrative shift, right? For Since the existence of Israel, um, especially here in the U.S., given that the U.S. is Israel's largest ally, um, you can't criticize Israel, right? No matter what they do, which we've known for a really long time, that it's ethnically cleansing the Palestinian people. I mean, you don't even need a report to know that. Just speak to a Palestinian that lives on the homeland, and you'll know the facts, right? Um, but I think it's incredibly significant today because the more human rights organizations and the more people in general, people in power, you know, um, very reliable organizations that shift the narrative by calling it what it is as opposed to feeding into Israeli propaganda, the more likely um, that it will shift overall. So, I mean, we, right now, in the last two years specifically, I think that Israel has been exposed in a way that's never been exposed before. Like, the propaganda no longer works. Last May, we saw with our own eyes, globally, um, just how bad the injustices that Israel commits on a daily basis are. You know, we have over more than 150,000 Palestinians at risk of losing their homes right now. Um, we have one of the largest if not, you know, the Palestinian people, if not the largest in the world, amount of refugees scattered globally. Um, you have the fact that Israel is the only country in the world that routinely tries children in military courts with a conviction rate of 95% of Palestinian defendants. So 
calling it what it is is very significant as opposed to just brushing it or, you know, keeping it under the rug and not. It's kind of like, I think the best example to give is the way that, you know, when you talk about home demolitions and basic ethnic cleansing, when the term evictions is used to cover up just how bad it is. Um, and so I think it's incredibly significant for more and more human rights organizations to come out and go against the status quo um, and call it an apartheid, apartheid state. You know, I, I, I want to get into this idea of, you know, human rights organizations finally calling it what it is and what it has been since the the creation of the state of Israel. But before we get into that conversation, can you highlight uh, what you feel might be some of the most important points made by the report? Yeah, I think the report is significant because there's so much, if you know about the issue, you know a lot of these things, right? But I think that because of Israeli propaganda, there's a lot that has been swept under the rug, like the hierarchy of IDs. A lot of people don't understand what it means to be a Palestinian and what it means to have a specific colored ID that literally dictates how you live within Israel and the occupied territories. Um, you know, the discriminatory restrictions on family reunification and the right to marry, the right to extend residency rights, um, the state-sanctioned racist administration of public land that excludes Palestinians from leasing on, accessing, developing, or owning the majority of public land that is their land under, you know, international law, um, the denial of the rights of both Palestinian refugees and present absentees, as Israel likes to call, to reclaim their homes, land, and pop- property, just like myself and my family, um, and the denial of the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their villages or homes. Um, and so these are just a few of the very significant things highlighted within the report. And, and uh, Aya, can you, going back to your point about the different ID cards that individuals will hold depending on their identity, um, and, and if they are um, identified as Palestinian, they have a different colored card, and then are therefore treated differently as a result of having to hold that different colored card based on their identity as a Palestinian. Can you talk about on a practical level, what that actu- what that looks like for Palestinians carrying a different colored card because of the fact that they're Palestinian. Yeah, I mean, it's so bad that it literally dictates, you know, one of our most basic human rights is freedom of movement, right? So within the occupied territories, if you have a specific colored card, that could dictate whether or not a child can take a certain road to go to school, right? That's how bad the restriction of movement is. That's how bad these how bad these IDs are. It can dictate whether or not you have the right to vote. And even then, if like let's say they like to call them Arab Israelis, the Palestinians who never left Israel, um, have the right to vote, or if they're a citizen, and even then they don't have the same rights that Jewish Israelis have, even if they have the same level of citizenship, so to speak. So I think that's like the most significant way to put it is that it even goes down to something as what you might think is a small movement. So what road a child can take to go to school. Children have to be smart enough to know how, what kind of route to take to school because they will be blocked depending on what kind of, you know, ID or citizenship, so to speak, they hold. So, uh, you know, as you said, um, importantly, that finally... You have an organization like Amnesty International calling Israel, calling it what it is and calling the system that Israel has put in place against Palestinians what it is, which is that it's an apartheid state. And for, you know, again, and but that's been the case since the creation of the state of Israel, which was founded upon a massacre of Palestinians. So, and, and human rights group, and other human rights groups have been calling it an apartheid state. Even anti-apartheid leaders and activists from South Africa have been calling it an apartheid state. Why do you think it took Amnesty International so long to finally come out with a report like this, acknowledging the truth of it? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And I think there could be a lot of different answers. One of them, like, 
to be frank, is just how much, you know, Israeli and Israeli ally propaganda has played a role in how anybody, whether it's an organization or just an individual, speaks about Israel's actions. You know, um, I think I've heard a lot of different things, like the fact that it took them four years to compile the amount of research that they did to include in the report. Um, there were things like, you know, pro-Israeli Zionists um, trying to sabotage the report. Um, so ultimately, I think it comes down to the fact that because of how normalized it's become to deter any form of criticism of the state of Israel, things as simple as like calling something what it is has become difficult even for a reliable and notable human rights organization. This is Middle East in Focus, and we are talking about Amnesty International's new research report entitled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians with our guest, Aya Ziada, Advocacy Director of American Muslims for Palestine. I, you know, continuing on this point of the fact that, you know, again, Israel is finally being called in what it is in accordance with international law, which is that it is an apartheid state. If you look at the way international law defines apartheid, can you discuss more specifically how the struggle of Palestinians is like that of black South Africans during apartheid, as many, as I stated before, South African anti-apartheid leaders have pointed out, including the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Yeah, I think there's a lot of similar similarities um, and a lot of differences, right? I mean, the two are very interconnected, but even Desmond Tutu himself, had stated that he saw so many similarities, but worse than South African apartheid. And I think that speaks a lot for itself. Um, I know former uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that Israel is not a state of all its citizens. It's Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and them alone. And that's very similar to the things that had been uttered um, in apartheid South Africa. And I think one of the most common um, intersectionalities of the two issues is what has been done to those resisting the apartheid on both ends. For example, um, a lot of uh, South African apartheid resistors were called or claimed that they were like a part of they had a communist agenda whenever they tried to resist uh, South African apartheid. And now you see today, which I'm sure we'll get into later, anybody who criticizes apartheid Israel is called anti-Semitic, right? Um, and so you see a lot of these overlaps in how um, both regimes had done everything they possibly could and continue to shut down any form of resistance um, by weaponizing oppression. And actually to that point, uh, which we're, we're seeing here in the United States, uh, dozens of U.S. lawmakers from both parties, uh, um, Democrats and Republicans, came out rejecting Amnesty's findings without even really addressing in detail Amnesty's thorough research and findings and simply rejected it and just labeled it as, quote unquote, as you stated, fueling anti-Semitism. Can you respond to that? Honestly, the best response I could give you is how shameful is it to be to be witnessing the truth and to stand on the wrong, awful side of history. Um, I can almost guarantee you that most of these U.S. lawmakers and, you know, political leaders didn't even read the report. But the minute that you mix Israel on apartheid and you have Israel's, you know, the U.S.'s longest standing ally, you know, the U.S. continuously aids Israel in every single aspect, um, of course, how could we call, you know, the U.S.'s best friend an apartheid state? Um, I think, honestly, it's, it's such a shame, especially given everything that has occurred since May of 2021 until now, until today, um, for these leaders to 
outright deny the truth. You know, there, there's, I don't even think that you can deny the truth anymore, which is why, why they continuously try to weaponize anti-Semitism now. And I think that's incredibly disrespectful and a slap in the face to Jews who actually experience real anti-Semitism on a daily basis. Um, but I, I think shameful doesn't even honestly articulate it as much as it should be. But, you know, we have the, what we call the apartheid delegation um, led by Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who recently went to Israel while Israel was actively ethnically cleansing um, Sheikh Zarrah and, Eastern, and families in Eastern Jerusalem and killed two teenage Palestinian boys, um, a total of five Palestinians killed in one week. Um, and to witness all of this happening and continuously say, as Nancy Pelosi said, that we are so proud of Israel and we're here to discuss our common democratic values while Israel is actively engaging in apartheid activities is shameful to say at the least. You know, I think what's what's interesting is that there's always a uh, complete lack of recognition of the many who um um, with who, the many within Jewish communities that are also standing in solidarity with others who are speaking out against Israel's apartheid system. Um, and so, you know, I think that one of the things that I, I found was very interesting when I, when I went to, um, Palestine was seeing the, which you don't really hear about here, the nonviolent resistance movement in Palestine that in, that in, that includes Palestinians and Israeli Jews that are joining forces together to speak out against this apartheid system and against the occupation and against the violence committed by the Israeli government. So, mm -hmm. and I, you know, and I think that one of the things that, as you noted, that's happening more and more here in the United States is that more and more people are speaking out. They are, they are refusing to deny the truth of things and they're being vocal about the truth of things, which again, and I will just keep repeating this because I think it's so significant to keep repeating that it is an apartheid state and it has been established as an apartheid state by international law. Part of those speaking out are also other groups of politicians within the U.S. government, a handful of progressive Democrats that I spoke about um, in the introduction, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, Cori Bush, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, who are actually uh, coming out in support of Amnesty's report. And even uh, you have Congresswoman McCollum um, trying to put forward a bill that would restrict Washington's $3.8 billion a year of military aid to Israel over the human rights abuses. Can you talk about this, the, the significance of these politicians that are coming out in support of the report and how impactful you think they, they could be? Oh, my goodness. I think it's incredibly impactful. I mean, I'm only 25 years old. I've been a part of, I am Palestinian myself. I've been a part of the movement since I was 16. But if you had told me, like, maybe three years ago, that we would have Congress members, Palestinian or non-Palestinian, vocalizing this issue and, and standing up no matter how against the status quo it is and calling it an apartheid state, I would never believe you. Because of how ingrained in our system it's become for the U.S. to undeniably and unconditionally support the state of Israel, I think it's incredibly significant. I think it's causing a huge shift in the way that Americans see and speak about Israel and Palestine today. I mean, um, Representative Betty McCollum it has proven time and time again to be on our side, to be on the, the you know, the side of the truth, frankly. And she said herself that Congress can no longer ignore or excuse Israel's occupation and system of, of oppression, um, which is exactly what it is. Um, and you have others like Representative Cory Bush, um, obviously Representative Rashida Tlaib, um, Representative Ehan Omar, who are consistently putting themselves on the line and speaking out against the status quo. And I think that's incredibly impactful. Um, but I think another layer that's impactful that, you know, should never be 
swept under the rug is constituents all over the country who are constantly pushing for this to happen too. Um, you know, people on the ground, in their states, in their cities who are constantly speaking about the issue more than ever before. Um, but like you said earlier, we are seeing a shift within the country where more and more people are speaking out against the issue. More and more people are recognizing um, Israel's injustices. I think there was like a report that came out that said the more Americans find out about Israel's truth, the more they dislike it, which is what we're seeing today. And thanks to, you know, these Congress members, these progressive Congress members who are consistently speaking out and creating such impactful legislation, I think that this narrative is, is going to continue to shift and it's going to force, especially within Congress itself, um, a shift in the narrative and say like, hey, you, you can't deny the truth anymore, um, which I think is happening. Even those who are still stand by Israel, which is probably the majority of Congress, can't even deny it anymore, which is why they jump to things like, oh, you're being anti-Semitic, because there is no more denial. The truth is out, and it cannot be denied, period. This is Middle East in Focus, and we are talking about Amnesty International's new research report entitled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians with our guest, Aya Ziada, Advocacy Director of American Muslims for Palestine. So, Aya, can you talk about how what we also see is not only the United States unconditional support for the state of Israel um, has been the case for decades uh, and really is is what is allowing Israel to continue its system of apartheid occupation and um, state sponsored violence against Palestinians. We also see Turkey, UAE, and Bahrain beginning the process of normalizing relations with Israel, Israel, despite, again, Israel being an apartheid state. Can you talk about the significance of this, if any, and the role of the United States in, in pushing this kind of normalization? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, we can't deny the fact that this is all mediated and pushed by the United States with the so called Abraham Accords, something that we're currently fighting, um, the Israeli Normalization Acts that are literally mediated by the U.S. between Bahrain, the UAE, Turkey, and Israel. Um, I think it's incredibly detrimental um, just seeing, especially like the UAE, seeing that example on how much has shifted in the last year, how much they've began to normalize. Uh, relations with Israel and teaching Israeli history, um, speaking only of Palestinians, saying that, you know, it's the Palestinians' fault. I think these relations are so dangerous and detrimental with the simple fact that it's telling the rest of the world that, hey, you know, like, obviously Israel is an apartheid state. Obviously Israel is occupying ethnically cleansing Palestinians. But money and power matters more in these relationships matter more than Palestinian lives. Um, I think that's that's what's happening. And the more that countries normalize relations with Israel, the harder it becomes for Israel to be held accountable. Um, and it's weakening this, like, long-standing pan-Arab position that has long called on Israel to withdraw from occupied territories um, and give Palestinian statehood. And so the more that countries like these agree and start to normalize ties with Israel, um, the harder it's going to become for Israel to be held accountable. It's pretty much giving Israel a pass, like, oh, you know, you're in a apartheid state, you are breaking every UN resolution, you are breaking international law, but it's okay, we don't care. That's, that's quite literally the message that it's sending to Palestinians and people all over the world. And can you, we just have a, a, a couple minutes left, can you lay out, again, you know, I, I spoke about it a little bit, and you spoke about it a little bit, but just a little bit in more detail, how the U.S. continues to support Israel's apartheid against Palestinians, and what U.S. policies must change to end Israel's system of apartheid occupation and human rights abuses against Palestinians? Yeah, I think... The tricky thing with the U.S. is it's a whole system that needs to come down. Again, since the creation of Israel, U.S. was its first 
and has been its longest standing ally, monetarily, vocally, on every aspect. You know, we are their biggest funder. Aside from other forms of funding, they receive three, over $3.8 billion in military funding a year. I mean, if you go look at the, the funding breakdown, it's terrifying. No country should ever receive that much funding just for military and weaponry use. And on top of that, it's the only state in the entire world that receives unconditional funding from the, from the U.S. The only state. So that says a lot. So when you have Israel consistently ethnically cleansing, as we see right now in Shukla Drach and most of East Jerusalem, um, and you see them granting only 33 building permits to Palestinians on Palestinian land, but then granting 16,500 building permits to Israeli settlers, which is annexation de facto, and having the U.S. still be like, oh, yeah, here's your money, you're cool, you're good, you're still our biggest ally, you're still a democracy, um, that's enabling, enabling and abetting in two different forms by continuously vocalizing their unconditional support monetarily and relationship-wise. Policy speaking, I think one of the most detrimental things right now is the Normalization Act. So you have H.R. 2748 in the House. There's also a Senate version, which is the Israel uh, Normalization Act of 2021. We're calling it literally the Apartheid Normalization Act because that's what it is. You have policies like this that are being backed up with bipartisan support. Incredibly detrimental, especially when the world, again, is witnessing the apartheid actions of Israel actively happening as we speak, as this kind of policy is being pushed. And, and you so know, I uh, we're, we policies. just have 30 seconds left. Yeah, it's not just one or two policies. It's a whole system shift that has to happen. The U.S. has to push back and start holding Israel accountable on all fronts, first and foremost, by cutting uh, monetary support. This is Middle East in Focus, we, and we have been talking about Amnesty International's new research report entitled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians with our guest, Aya Ziada, Advocacy Director of American Muslims for Palestine. Thank you so much, Aya, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.